Hello and welcome. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX, and I'm delighted to be with all of you for a discussion in the lead up to the LDC5 conference in Doha, Qatar, postponed, but now coming in early 2023. This is an important moment in the global development calendar, although it doesn't always get the attention it deserves. You know, the least developed country designation was first made, I think, in the 1960s, and every 10 years there's been a conference where least developed countries get together and the world really thinks about what are the challenges and opportunities to move forward. This is really vital if you care about the sustainable development goals, if you care about making progress on issues like poverty, because so much of it is concentrated in what are now 46 highly fragile countries. And the question is, how do you move these forward? Well, LDC5 will tackle those questions head on. And one important element of it is a private sector lens. And that private sector forum is co-chaired by Microsoft. And Microsoft's our partner for today's session, where we're really trying to think through what is the role of private sector in leveraging some of these opportunities that exist in what are some of the most vulnerable and fragile countries around the world. Some of those opportunities include connection to the internet. It's still 80% of the population of these countries do not have access to the internet. You'll hear from some specific country examples coming up today. And in many of these places, there's enormous opportunity to bring in different kinds of financing, blended financing, to help close those gaps on connectivity, on energy, and on many other topics. To do that, we've got to bring together partners. You need multi-stakeholder partnerships, and you need to find a way to bring governance, good governance, to the table for all of these initiatives. It's so key to making progress. So. There's an enormous opportunity when you think of the youth bulge in these countries, some 70% of the population under 14 years of age. If you can invest in skilling people, create the jobs of the future and the talent of the future, there's a huge chance to make enormous progress in a group of countries that collectively add up to over a billion people. So I think this deserves our attention. And I appreciate you being, a, being here and being a part of it, our audience joining us from around the world. We're delighted at DevX to partner with Microsoft to bring this important session to you today. I want to bring in our first opportunity to, to learn on this topic. Here's Kate Warren, Executive Vice President and Executive Editor at DevX. Well, thank you, Raj. Uh, I am delighted to kick off the event today with a conversation on the private sector and LDC5. Uh, I can think of no two better speakers than John Frank, who's Vice President for UN Affairs at Microsoft, and Her Excellency Ambassador Agnes Chambiri, Malawi's Permanent Representative to the United Nations, to set the stage for today's event and discuss how the private sector can promote development in the least developed countries. So thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so to get started, Ambassador Chimbiri, uh, I would like to start with you. Uh, you are the chair of the group of LDCs at the UN. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why this LDC5 conference and the Doha program of action is so important for advancing sustainable development in LDCs such as Malawi. The Doha program of action and sustainable development goals, uh, sustainable development, enhancing that in, uh, in this way is really very important and um, mainly because the LDCs have issues, challenges that they are going through because of the situation that um, of development whereby all the um, the gains that they have been gained um, have been made in the past decade have been wiped out because of the COVID, because of other conflicts. And the Doha program of action priorities are really aligned to the sustainable development goals. They are all related to poverty reduction. They are also related to climate financing. And, you know, so um, issues that if we have achieved the um, program of action goals that are overarching program of action goals, it will mean that we'll be achieving the sustainable development goals because the priorities are similar. But the past four decades that we've done, um, tried, much of what was gained has been lost in the past decade because of the issues of COVID and other disasters. That's an excellent point. And so John, Microsoft is convening the LDC5 Private Sector Forum. 
So what are you hoping the outcomes will be? And then what would you say to other private sector actors on how they should get involved with LDC-5? Well, the UN holds this least developed country conference only once every 10 years. And so it's an incredible opportunity to participate in the discussion and, and help shape the direction uh, for the next 10 years. Um, the private sector plays an incredibly important role in across all these societies. And, and you know, we believe in the power of, of entrepreneurship uh, to transform the lives of people around the world. Now, it's going to be local companies, regional companies, as well as global companies that are going to be doing that. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for everybody to, to come together to, to talk about what are new forms of partnership for the 21st century, working with governments and development agencies to be able to make a difference and accelerate that positive impact um, of, that business can bring to societies. Uh, and so we've been talking with companies around the world uh, about the opportunities and the challenges of doing business. We've also been engaging in multi-stakeholder conversations by having development agencies and donor nations give advice and, and have conversations. And of course, you know, deep engagement with the LDCs themselves to talk about this. Um, across the, the, the industry sectors that uh, this conference will address, we found some common topics. Um, you know, it is important that we figure out how to bring connectivity to these countries because it is foundational to so many aspects of digital society today. Uh, so making economic progress in agriculture or energy uh, is greatly enhanced by, by increasing connectivity. Um, looking at the cost of capital and how we bring that cost down uh, in a responsible way with blended finance models. Um, recognizing that across all these countries, across all these industries, human capital is hugely important. So what can we do to increase the skilling and education opportunities um, and sort of train workers for the 21st century? Um, and finally, you know, it's, it comes down to global governance, uh, good governance in the, in the national capitals uh, and local governments, but also, you know, what are the right multi-stakeholder models to, to bring this together to create those new opportunities? So that's why we're excited by this. Uh, and uh, we found it uh, incredibly productive and we greatly appreciate everybody's participation. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chimbiri, thinking about, you know, all the ways that, that John mentioned the private sector can catalyze uh, investments and progress, um, from where you sit as your country's representative to the UN, how optimistic are you that LDC Bible will really move the needle on progress in this area? I am very optimistic, and the LDC group is very optimistic, because the private sector is a key player. Um, in the coalition of multi-stakeholder partnerships, that is very key to achievement of sustainable development goals. Um, the role of the private sector will be key in uh, providing financial support, in providing technological support, in linking the government and other partners, because the private sector has a, a real capability in terms of technological innovation, as well as uh, entrepreneurship that is technically driven. So um, I feel that the private sector forum that is there led by Microsoft will be really key to, to the advancement of sustainable development in LDCs and through support to the implementation of the Doha program of action and that their support would be key through financial mobilization of finances bringing in more finances so called financing with other partners and through this global coalition and that um, key one another key example would be the one of digital transformation where the private sector will be key to ensure that there's connectivity, there's a, a bridging the gap with the digital divide between the rural and the poor and the urban, and the poor countries and the rich countries, women and men. So I do feel that really the needle will be moved if the private sector is a part and parcel 
of the whole process of planning and implementation of the Doha program of action. They've already been part of the planning by being part of the consultations and the development of the Doha program of action. And therefore, implementation, they have to play a key role and that will take us forward and make most of the LDCs graduate from being listed developed countries to more of medium to high income countries. And John, you know, you mentioned uh, blended finance as a tool to help LDCs. And so how do you see approaches such as this in really catalyzing investment? And, you know, how is Microsoft currently leveraging blended finance to, to boost impact in LDCs? You know, the basic idea of blended finance is that uh, government donor nations and development agencies will invest along with in a private sector enterprise project to um, to help it and lower the cost of capital and make projects that wouldn't otherwise get off the ground be successful. So, you know, for us, we're a co-investor with those agencies. Um, and and for us, it's it's the ability to, to help local regional companies um, advance faster and do better work. And, and for us, it's important that we do it in a responsible way. Um, but it's also an incredible opportunity to use our, our capital resources um, to, to have greater social impact. And just quickly, in our last couple of minutes together, what would be your call to action to private sector leaders when it comes to their role in advancing progress on these crucial issues um, like connectivity, blended finance, and LDCs? Uh, Ambassador Chimberi, I'll start with you. Thank you very much. The private sector needs to be part and parcel of the global uh, partners that will assist the LDCs to implement the Doha program of action. And the key action is financing, uh, providing technology, and providing the technology, uh, accelerating the um, digital transformation in the countries, LDCs, particularly through building capabilities, productive capabilities, and also digital capabilities. And John, how about you? For us, we believe that, you know, connectivity and building out access to the internet is, is incredibly important as a foundation for development across the range of sectors. The agriculture sector is the largest sector in most of these countries. Um, the digital transformation can, can help increase yields and provide more food uh, and lower the, the carbon impact. Um, but across all sectors, connectivity is an incredible opportunity uh, and foundational. Uh, in this 21st century, um, we need to bring people together. And so projects like the Partners to Connect at ITU are incredibly important and asking people to, to look at what they can do and the opportunities they're created um, when we help connect this uh, group. Um, by, by the year 2050, one quarter of the world's young people will live in these 46 countries. Um, you know, the incredible opportunity, the, the talent, the youth, the energy um, from these countries is an incredibly important part and a big part of our world. And so really encourage everybody to, to get engaged. Right, thank you. Yeah, so we will continue to discuss all these topics. Um, as you say, this is an incredible opportunity. Uh, so thank you for your time today. Um, we now have a video from Malawi where Microsoft and their partner Hunger Project are working on initiative to close the digital divide in rural areas. So we'll play that for you now. Hunger Project and Microsoft are working toward a sustainable, comprehensive approach to rural connectivity that enables women's digital inclusion in particular. So in Malawi, we're working with Microsoft and local communities to establish a community ICT center with workspaces that's going to include computers uh, that are dedicated for the community uh, in five communities where we work across the southern region of Malawi. 
So Malawi has one of the lowest electrification rates in the world, according to the World Bank. There's a, an additional 41% gap between men and women accessing the internet in Malawi. That means for every two men that have access to the internet, there's only one woman. With our partnership with Microsoft, we envision reaching three objectives through this. First, providing and enhancing access to the internet for more than 70,000 people. Second of all, we're looking at the enabling environment for communities, particularly women, to gain internet access and using it for their livelihoods. And that relates to our third component, which is to offer opportunities through access to digital services, content, and training. When we introduce a new idea to people that maybe have never encountered it, sometimes there's resistance. It takes time to get to know technology. Human capacity, excitement to learn, this is, this is really present in all the communities where we've worked. And we found that if there's opportunity, people reach out for it. And that's very important to create something that really speaks to their needs and listening to their needs is absolutely fundamental here. We're calling on all of those working on digital inclusion to really consider the why. Why connect to the internet? Why expand digital inclusion? For us, that's demand from the communities for better livelihoods knowledge, information access, and for us to connect them to resources that's meaningful to them is absolutely critical. I'll now pass it back to Raj Kumar for a panel on how multi-stakeholder participation can advance connectivity in the LDC. So over to you, Raj. Well, welcome back to our event where we're talking about how to accelerate progress in the least developed countries. And we're really zoning in now on some of the key opportunities. We could think about challenges. These are least developed countries, but really focusing on opportunities for the private sector to play a more forward-leaning role in helping countries to come out of this period that we're in, the pandemic period, and to see how they can better connect their population to the internet, improve skilling to connect to the modern economy, and so many other issues like that. So I just wanna welcome an incredible panel that we have with us to get into these topics. These are people who work on these issues every single day, and I'm just delighted to have them with us. We've got Alex Wong, who's the Chief of Special Initiatives at the International Telecommunications Union. We got Selina, Selina Lee, who's the CEO and co-founder of Zindi. Louise James, the Managing Director for Accenture Development Partners. Uh, we're also joined by Minister of Information and Communications for the Government of Sierra Leone, Mohamed Soare. And uh, finally, Nick Rudnick, who is the Group CEO at Liquid Intelligent Technologies. I think he used to be known as Econet for people who are more familiar with that name, Nick. Uh, it's great to have all of you here together to have this conversation. Maybe I can just start with you, Nick, because there's been so much promise around the idea of connectivity. Um, we all have probably experienced this ourselves during this pandemic period, during the period of lockdowns, how important access to the internet has become for kids attending school, for getting access to health information, for just continuing to work or do your business from wherever you are. In least developed countries, about a billion people, about 800 million or so don't have access to the internet. It's, a, it's an enormous sum of people. They're really cut off from the modern economy. The technology exists. Certainly the desire and will is there in the part of the international community. Why haven't we been able to bridge this? What, what is missing in, in your experience, Nick, actually providing internet in some of these challenging environments? Well, I think, you know, it's the, the infrastructure now does in fact largely exist. And I think both the uh, fiber and wireless networks uh, are there. And uh, in fact, when we've looked at the networks across Africa, you know, almost 90% of the population is living within uh, 20 kilometers of a fiber network, yet uh, are still unable to uh, access that connectivity in an affordable way or you know, even at all. So I think you know, the next step is about uh, expanding the existing networks utilizing uh, new technologies, utilizing uh, radio spectrum that um, is either free or low cost uh, to use such as uh, Wi-Fi and really you know, broadening the network out and letting people um, you know, have an ability to, to connect onto those networks. I mean, I've been out um, 
building networks in remote places where people have come out to see, you know, us putting duct in the ground in remote villages and, you know, saying, what are we doing? And we say, well, we're building the information superhighway. It'll pass directly under your feet, connecting one major city to another. But, uh, you know, you may not have access to it. And I think that is the, the thing that now uh, needs to change. The technologies are there and it, it really is the, 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 the problem and the solution that uh, we need to find going forward. Yeah, I guess the, the thing that sounds really incredible is that there is access in some places and yet we haven't connected and figured out this affordability question to get people access to it. And yet in others, we maybe need to have a technology revolution or to come up with new solutions that are truly designed for rural populations that fit the unique characteristics of those populations and are inexpensive enough. Maybe we can bring, bring in the minister now to get a sense for how this looks in your country, in Sierra Leone, as you try to expand internet access there. What are some of the barriers you're facing? Okay, thank you very much. Um, we recognize that Africa, um, has missed out on three industrial revolutions. We know this is an opportunity for us not to miss out on the digital revolution. So in Sierra Leone, we um, we liberalized the gateway in 2020, in 2002. Since then, we've, we've been able to attract various sector players into the IC teleco city telecom sphere. Um, to date, we have about 32.4 uh, percent of the population connected, which means we still have an excess of 67 percent to be connected. Um, the way to go. I just to undermine is, that, you've got 67 ministers, 67 percent, two thirds of the country is not connected today. Not connected at all. Not connected at all. That is quite a very serious number. Most of them live in rural areas. So, government treats that very seriously. That's the most productive part of our population. So we have set up a universal access development fund to which uh, mobile network operators contribute a percentage of their gross revenues before tax um, so that we can take ICT and broadband connectivity to rural, unserved and underserved communities. Apart from that, uh, we, have, uh, we have also done major um, regulatory reforms to create greater predictability um, in the sector. At the moment, um, we, the law which is currently in parliament makes provision for a technology neutral regime because we recognize that the previous regime makes business cumbersome, it makes attracting the private sector a lot more difficult. So that's, that's a work in progress. Um, we are currently in discussions with the World Bank. We have an earmark for a $50 million grant um, to, to expand broadband um, connectivity um, raise digital awareness, and at the same time, enhance government capacity to deliver government services. So all of these things are on course. We are now beginning to discuss with the World Bank how to um, how to give incentives to mobile network operators to be able to provide um, a mobile phones um, that should be able to enhance broadband. At the same time, sometime last year. You know, all, we only landed the, the undersea cable here, Africa coast to Europe uh, in 2012. Um, we have given that to the private sector. We believe with the private sector, we will be able to get more competitive. We'll be able to uh, accelerate use of data and a lot of things. Because the ultimate objective is we want to be able to, um, you know, our government is very heavy when it comes to human capital development which talks about um, food security, education, and health. So this is, it is in this regard that um, we're working with GIGA, for example, to connect about 11,000 schools in Sierra Leone. So a lot of efforts- I'm, I'm sure a lot of people, Minister, I'm sure a lot of people following this know, but GIGA is this uh, initiative to connect all the schools in the world to the internet, right? It's led by UNICEF and partners. Yeah. So yes, 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 this is a pilot phase. This is a pilot phase to connect 11,000 schools. Once that is done, there are other private sector players who are also interested um, in that same um, space. For example, the World Bank funding, we are in advanced stage of discussions. They also want to be able to connect schools to bridge the digital divide. 
I went to a rural community school, um, you know, um, but my kids go to school in Frita. So we want a situation where, by virtue of where you stay, should not disadvantage you getting the same learning, the same tuition, the same quality education that somebody in Frita or elsewhere in the world gets. So these are the things we're doing. You may have known that we have allocated 22% of our GDP to education, right? This is all part of our commitment to ensure that no one is left behind and enjoying the digital dividends. And you know, you went to a rural school, my father went to a rural school in South India, and you think back at the time, maybe things in a way were more equal because as long as you had books or some access to something to write on, right? You were in some ways more equal to an urban school. Nowadays, if you don't have the internet in a rural school, it's like you're in a different era completely, right? You're, you've completely been cut off from, from modern education. I, I wanna come back to you, but let me first go to Alex here. I wanna bring others into the discussion. Um, Alex, you know, at the global level where you operate on things like initiatives like GIGA, right? Um, where the International Telecommunications Union works, We've been having this discussion for a really long time, and it sounds like from the perspective of the minister, you know, we need regulatory change at the country level. We need maybe some new business models. There is a technology question. You need to get smarter phones in the hands of people. Are we at a turning point yet? Is this, is this that moment? A lot of us thought it would be when the pandemic hit that there would become an obvious no-brainer to invest in connectivity and make this a higher priority. Are you seeing that yet at the global level on which you operate? Yeah, th thanks, Raj. Well, it's happening, but very slowly. Uh, um, I want to start with a couple what I call the eye popping stats, because uh, when we talk about the least developed countries, um, there's some real shocking figures that show the amount of work that's still required um, on coverage. Um, Nick mentioned already the work that's needed. And of course, most people think, oh, no, coverage, everyone's got a cell phone signal. And in the developed world, it's 99% coverage. You're right. But in the LDCs, the least developed countries, coverage remains, there's still 24% of the population that has no coverage. There's no signal um, for, the, for the phone, if they had one. You're moving to the supply side, that's the supply side, moving to the demand side. As an example, price of a smartphone. Our latest statistics say that the average price of a smartphone costs 95% of the monthly income of a person living in the LDC. And Minister Sowery, I'm sure you're aware, Sierra Leone, our statistics say 636% of your monthly salary or your monthly income would be needed to pay for a smartphone. So with that kind of affordability, there is no affordability. Um, and then skills, uh, we had in our Partner Connect session yesterday, a poll where we asked the audience, how many people um, how many people in the LDCs have the right digital skills to access the internet? I, I myself was shocked, I got it wrong because I went for the category that said five to 20%, but actually indeed across the LDCs, it's around 3%. 3% of people actually have the skills to use the internet. So you have these huge challenges. And here we are in 2022, when 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was commitments by the global community to get everyone connected and everyone covered. So we still have a large way to go. But you know, ministers like Minister Sauri, you no, know, I mean, Mr. Sauri, you said exactly some of the things that need to be done. They're not complicated. Well, they are complicated um, on what needs to be done to you know move us forward. Um, I'll just mention them really briefly on the policy regulation side. I mean, in, in, there's really three broad buckets. It's about how do you think about infrastructure? Can you get um, more active and passive sharing of infrastructure that reduces costs? Spectrum, that's the other big lever. How do you use spectrum as a regulator so that you can make um, smarter use of the spectrum that you have to drive the connectivity? And the third is the universal service funds or equivalent sources of funding the government has. How can that be used to then lead into more innovative approaches like the blended finance. I know we're going to talk to you. I'll just mention really briefly these final, the other three items to do, which um, are more politically complicated, but Minister Sauber, you already mentioned uh, permitting. So permitting, taxes, and foreign ownership, much more sensitive issues for many countries, but they're also all barriers um, that prohibit, um, you know, more connectivity. So, you know, the, the pieces are all there. Everyone knows them. Um, that's the real progress I think we've made. And, you know, having the multi-stakeholder approach as we have on this panel is exactly how we can move things forward. Thanks, Raj. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And it is, it is good to hear that in a way we know what's required. You know, we've come to the point where it's not a mis mystery. It's not, you know, how are we ever going to tackle this? We actually have a lot of very clear thinking about what's required. It's just a question now of doing it. And that's, Easier said than done, of course. The how is usually the complex part in global development. This is complex. These are 46 diverse countries. 
with their own political situations. Many are fragile states. You know, this is not an easy an easy place to operate. But hopefully, the imperative is there now to do something. Maybe we can get a little closer to the ground, Selena, by bringing you into the discussion because you're working a lot on these data and development opportunities, projects, or platforms uh, that you've helped to lead over a whole career on that intersection of data and development. What are some of the opportunities if we actually get connectivity? And why does this matter, in a sense, if you get connectivity into these communities? What can we do with it today? Yeah, um, it, great question. I mean, it's it's something that we're working on at Zindi. Zindi is a platform where we host nearly 40,000 African data scientists um, solving real world problems, real data, working on real data sets for companies, governments, nonprofit organizations to unlock some of the solutions that will be needed in the age of connectivity and building on some of the data sets that are going to be generated. I mean, the minister mentioned that as we increase connectivity, we also need to increase the skills that are needed to, uh, to unlock the power of the data that's going to be generated undoubtedly. Um, so on Zindi, we've worked on anything from um, IoT sen uh, air quality sensors to um, agricultural applications of AI to um, identify different crop diseases, predict crop yields, um, all the way to like normal business problems where we're unlocking potential, I guess, business efficiencies and um, impact on the ground. So, I mean, it, I think the, the possibilities are endless, but I think the most important thing is to realize that it, how important it is to level the playing field to make sure that everyone has access to these data-driven solutions, to building the data-driven solutions and also have access to, um, to implementing these data-driven solutions. And that's something where upskilling and investment in um, you know, human capital will come in. Yeah, and it gets so connected to some of the other issues we're talking about. It's kind of a chicken and the egg question, right? It, how do you get good governance if people can't find out what their government is doing by going to their phone, connecting with public services, public agencies, which is what's done so commonly now in advanced economies. How do you get to skills if people don't even have access to the platforms where you can learn, right? So these things are all very interconnected. Uh, Louise, maybe that's a good jumping off point to bring you in. You and I sit on this, this World Economic Forum Future Council on Fragility and Resilience. I know for that council and for Microsoft, you've been doing a lot of work talking to people in least developed countries talking to people on the front lines of these issues and trying to understand, well, let's clarify what the opportunities actually are and how do we get there? Here's the roadmap, right? What do you see on your roadmap, Luis? Thanks, Raj. And I think what's been really interesting through the work of the council is saying that, yes, we need connectivity. Yes, we need devices, but also we need solutions that are actually designed with the consumer at the heart. Um, and we've seen over the years um, that actually many digital solutions have been designed in isolation, ironically, of the end user. So we see low adoption and poor take up. So one of the things that the council has really been emphasizing is guidelines around how you put the user at the heart and how you make sure that you actually develop a solution that is really, really tailored to the local context. And that in turn will drive adoption. I think the other thing I would mention, and, and Alex and others mentioned it, is that what we saw during COVID was obviously a plethora right, of digital solutions, including in LDCs. But the fact that you needed to really design with thinking about the very low connectivity or zero connectivity context, as well as the connected. Um, and one example was some work we did um, funded by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in Bangladesh, working with UK retailers and, and non-profits in Bangladesh with garment workers. Um, and it was a great initiative leveraging digital tools in the factories for messaging around COVID, around um, health messaging, sanitation, etc. But actually, many of the women in the factories in particular did not have access to smartphones. So what they did was actually bring tablets into the factory so that that training was accessible to every single factory worker and that it wasn't therefore leaving people behind who simply didn't have access to the technology. Yeah, and it just, should, you know, I wonder if the, if the economic analysis has been done, but think of all the costs associated with trying to plan and design around the lack of connectivity, right? In some ways, it might be more expensive than just actually connecting people to the internet and being able to deliver services more directly. Uh, there, there's a cost on the other side of that ledger. In a moment, I'm going to ask our producers to play a, a video clip, but, you know, just as we get into this, I think what we're starting to see from all of your interventions here is how issues like governance, like skills, like building partnerships, like figuring out the financing, they're all connected to connectivity. It isn't just, 
you know, let's go install microwave towers, right? There's a lot of these things that are connected together and that's what makes it a stickier problem. Then of course you overlay the context. These are very challenging environments and we have to think about that context. And I think that's where the next clip could be really useful to see. So I'll ask our producers to please play this clip from Sunday Bridget Jones of the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. I'm Sunday Bridget Jones, Chief Partnerships and Advocacy Officer for the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. It's a real honor to join you all for this event in the lead up to the fifth United Nations Conference on Least Developed Countries. A global accelerated energy transition is truly an urgent and global effort, and it cannot leave aside the energy needs of least developed countries. Until now, however, this has been the case. Efforts to protect the planet have excluded the energy needs and economic aspirations of billions of people in a developing and emerging world. And by 2050, 81 energy poor countries, which collectively contribute only 8% of today's emissions, will produce more than 75%. Yet these countries currently receive just 20% of clean energy financing, despite representing nearly half of the world's population. The world has yet to unite in action to support an equitable energy transition for everyone, everywhere. Without urgent action, in order to safeguard the livelihoods of their citizens, developing and emerging countries will prioritize growth with fossil fuels at the expense of our shared climate future. The energy transition is so big and multifaceted, we need multiple partners at the table. We need bold, collaborative, integrated thinking and investment that will address the short-term as well as long-term challenges. We must leverage public and private development and philanthropic dollars to unlock opportunity for the world's most vulnerable as we combat climate change. And that's what the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet is doing. Together, we can build a future in which everyone has access to the electricity and opportunities they need to compete in the modern economy even as we all work together to end the climate crisis. So we look forward to working with you all and invite countries, development institutions, philanthropies, and private sector to join us in identifying the solutions, developing the regulations, and enabling the investments needed to unlock countries' clean energy markets and change energy for good. Well, thanks so much to my friend Sunday Bridget Jones for that uh, fantastic intervention. The reason I wanted to bring it to you is these kinds of alliances, these multi-stakeholder partnerships are, seem to be key for operating in these challenging environments and bringing together all the players we're talking about. It can be, it can be tough to do it if you don't have a, a mechanism like that. And obviously energy is very connected to connectivity, right? If you don't have access to, to power, how are you gonna power all of these, these connectivity services? So I, I just wanted to bring that to the table and, and try to get the conversation going around multi-stakeholder. What, what do we actually do to bring together all of these players. And maybe Nick, I can go back to you on this. Um, and then anyone else who wants to jump in, just indicate to me, you know, you're a, a traditional telecom in a lot of ways, right? Nick, you're, you're out there providing connectivity, but on the other hand, you're doing it in these challenging environments where the funding might not all come from a government. Maybe you need international funding the blended finance instruments. How do you think about the context for bringing together partners to deliver what you're trying to deliver in your work at Liquid? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it sometimes can be a double edged sword um, because uh, I, I think at times bringing together too many stakeholders uh, can actually uh, complicate and, and delay things. And I think that if one looks at the uh, rollout of uh, networks and technology across Africa, uh, where it has happened the most uh, efficiently is where there's been in a way bilateral arrangements that have allowed that to happen you know the government working with private sector or you know working with uh with with other agencies so but i i do think that where one comes across very complex problems um in in that circumstance then you know uh putting in place um you know more uh multilateral type uh, engagements to solve, you know, some of the more intractable and, and complex problems of, of connectivity and creating the whole ecosystem that we've been talking about, you know, in, in, in those somewhat limited circumstances, I think there, 
that there is a role to play. But you know, talking from the the private sector point of view, um, you know, uh, sometimes it's better not to have too many uh, multilateral agencies working on on one project. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Nick, and I appreciate you pushing back on that point because it, it can sound great to have everyone together at the table, but in some ways, you're aiming for the simplicity of a clear mandate, a clear source of funding, go in and do the work, get the connectivity going. Louise, you wanted to ch chime in. Yeah, and you know, Raj, we, we work on many multi-stakeholder partnerships, uh, but I would echo with Nick, it's about when is the right time, right, to bring, bring in multiple players. I just wanted to mention about the blended financing, again, through the, the council's work, what we've seen is really the need in LDCs to understand the local private sector. Um, and when opportunities, programs are being looked at, actually understanding what is already in place and what can potentially be scaled through partnering with the private sector or where is a new intervention needed and understanding that often these interventions are high risk so how can you bring together multiple partners to de-risk that and encourage the blended financing the private sector investment to come in but actually having a view to the long-term medium sustainable business model and trying to sort of move away as we all talk about these solutions which don't actually end up having a viable business model and therefore don't last so i think that is where you see a real opportunity for partnership to work at that very early stage to say how does this go through the pipeline of investment where up front there may be more development financing investment in there but actually you're slowly crowding in more private investment as the business model develops and emerges yeah it makes a lot of sense that if you think about a connected society you know uh, our minister here Mohammed Swari was saying that, that two-thirds of his country are not connected if you imagine that overnight somehow magically we connect all of these people you're going to change the economy pretty dramatically, right? All those small and medium enterprise businesses have lots of different opportunities now, and they may need different workers who have different kinds of skills. And so thinking through all those implications uh, can change the way we approach this issue. There's a simple element to it, just deliver internet, but, but there is a, a broader set of implications and maybe the minister wants to chime in on that. And then I'll go to you, Alex. Yeah, so um, talking about partnerships, I just wanted to share a quick example of, of how Sarali has pulled that off. Um, when my government came to power in 2018, we did not have a cyber crime law, but we recognized the fact that many of our citizens were connected to one social media platform or the other, they are in digital space. So at the African Union, I made a, a very passionate appeal for support to Sierra Leone. A clearinghouse system was set up with potential donors all seated in the same room so as to avoid duplicity. Um, we had technical commitment, financial commitment from the Council of Europe, um, from ECOWAS, Today, we have a cyber crime legislation, one of the most progressive in the region. Um, um, the European Union, through the Glacier program, is supporting ECOWAS to get for us a national SAT. And there is ongoing training for prosecutors, for, for, for the SAT members, and all the whole ecosystem. This is to ensure that we are able to make digital space as safe as in real life. So, yes, more, um, partnerships work, and we are quite a very bright example of what we can achieve through partnerships. Well, I'm glad you brought that example, both because it's great to hear about the partnership, but also because, yeah, it's worth thinking through that connectivity alone is not just an unmitigated good, right? There's a lot of potential challenge here, cyber crime, certainly misinformation, people being you know, exposed to all kinds of frauds, and people are not used to being connected to the internet and not knowing what information to trust. That is an element of this, it's so important. Um, Alex, and we're starting to get a little tight on time, so I'll just ask to keep it relatively brief. Go ahead. No, I, I was smiling when Nick made his comment because there's an African proverb, at least I think it's African, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. But we know how hard that is. Um, partnerships are hard. So I'll just mention briefly the Partner Connect Digital Coalition. We launched it yesterday. We opened the pledging platform. Um, it's the first UN platform to pledge for connectivity. Uh, we're trying to do it as one UN as much as possible because that's really complicated for minister people like yourself where there's 10 different UN agencies trying to work with you. So we do have the leadership of UNDP, UN Women, UNICEF, you know, all the uh, key agencies involved. And I mean, this pledging platform is an attempt to try to bring together the different actors so we can see publicly what people are pledging. So as an example, yesterday, uh, the minister from Ghana pledged, you know, to the global audience, uh, her commitment to build cell tower infrastructure and also to put in some financing to connectivity. And then we had Vodafone pledge a CapEx commitment for infrastructure rollout in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we had Microsoft pledge um, to train 10 million people. So that's all great, 
not how do we make that work in a country? And we believe that the UN has a role to do that. So we're super excited that yesterday was a, was a start. We hope everyone on this call will make a call. Minister Salvador, we're looking forward to hearing Sierra Leone's pledge. Um, so that's our contribution to this. Um, and I just want to bring in the, the comment about the energy industry. That's another example where we need to get that industry working together with the ICT industry, because we know that when they come in, you can actually create sustainable models uh, on the financing. Uh, you know, we, don't, we won't have time to talk about blended finance, but that, you know, bringing in other actors to help uh, put in the, the financing will be critical. Thank you. It sounds like a really timely initiative because there is this moment now, it feels like with the pandemic that people say, we've got to invest in connectivity, but it's hard to see it. It's so diffuse, right? So having that one place where people can make those pledges and you can see it is important. Selena, can I come to you on what I think of, and I think many people do, is one of the most powerful opportunities around connectivity, which is digital finance, digital literacy skills. This is something booming in even the lowest income economies where people are, are able to send money to each other, make transactions, and it really opens up a new opportunity in the economy and it, it equalizes things in many ways for women and other marginalized people in some communities. So what do you see as that opportunity? Is there a tipping point here or how should we be thinking about it in the context of this discussion? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really exciting what's been happening in Africa. I mean, they've really led the way in a lot of ways on digital financial services and just the innovation because, you know, given the context, there it calls for innovation, innovative uses of technology, innovative uses of machine learning and AI and, you know, even, um, you know, what types of uh, phones and devices people are using. So I think um, we are at something of a tipping point in Africa is my feeling is just, you know, the uh, with with the accessibility of, of financial services, but of course, there's still a long way to go. And I think that data science and machine learning actually can play an important driving role just in how we can innovate, continue to innovate in that space. So the, the big conference that this session is kind of creating some momentum around and try, trying to bring some key themes to the LDC5 conference, it's been postponed due to COVID. We all know that it's coming up, uh, I guess, the beginning of 2023. As we wrap up our, our discussion here today, what's what's one thing you want to make sure that when that conference convenes people are really thinking about they're really aware of can you can you give us just one idea in a very brief form as we as we close out i'll start with you louise if that's okay for me it would be connectivity in the context of the green economy and thinking about an inclusive green transition and, and just ensuring that we're thinking about the skills as, as many have mentioned today to ensure that we can really transition to adjust green economy in LDCs. Yeah, I love that point and that connectivity is a key element of it. Nick, can I go to you? Yeah, I think it, it, it really is uh, a, a matter of making sure that the entire ecosystem uh, is working uh, in an efficient way. And that is, you know, bringing together all components of it, whether um, it's uh, government regulation and t taxation that should be promoting efficiency uh, and rewarding correct behaviors, um, uh, making sure that the infrastructure that is there on the ground uh, is not underutilized, but is also utilized to its full efficiency and that we get you know the right pricing and affordable services for all these digital services that you know uh, run off the infrastructure layer that that is there and how about you alex partner to connect and and getting giga into as many ldcs as we can in the next year yeah, those are two big initiatives on this landscape that it'll be interesting to see where we are next year when we gather at LDC5. Um, and Selena. I think it's fundamentally important that we continue to upskill our youth um, in least developed countries and make sure that they're part of a solution because they're the ones who will be most impacted by these solutions. Yeah, that's a great point. I think across the LDC5, I'm going to get the statistic wrong. 70% of the population is under 14 years of age, something like that. These are these are countries where the demographics skew is very young. Um, it's a great point to, to bring in. They need to be part of this discussion. And maybe just the final word from you, Minister. Also, the big dream for that conference will be rural connectivity. Majority of our citizens live in rural communities, they're into agriculture, they're into all sorts of things. So connecting them will go a long way to closing the digital divide. 
Well, I want to thank all of you. And as we close out our session, um, we're going to be seeing a video a clip from a colleague, Kavita Sinha of the Green Climate Fund, that I think is going to add something to the conversation we've had here today. But I'm sure people who are following along are joining me in thanking you from wherever they are, their kitchens and living rooms, uh, for this fantastic, insightful discussion. And I will look forward to seeing all of you virtually or in person at the LDC5 conference. Um, and I really look forward to the important work you're all doing in the lead up to that. So thank you for being a part of this. Thank you so very much. Thank you. GCF, as you know, uh, is the world's largest climate fund. We have so far approved $10 billion uh, in uh, projects that total up to a value of $40 billion. We were set up by 94, 194 countries to catalyze investment at scale and crowd in private and public capital in those countries which would otherwise not get that capital. So one of our central features is to make blended finance work for developing countries, especially the least developed countries where others may not invest for climate action. GCF is capital agnostic, so our investments are tailor-made or custom designed for the needs of the project and for the country, and these can combine grant equity loans, uh, depending on what the needs of the country is. We also do guarantees. One of the examples I would use to illustrate what we do is uh, something that we approved, our board approved last October. This is uh, for the first time at scale private equity uh, fund uh, in blue economy. This is called the Global Fund for Coral Reef Investment Window. And one of our partners and international accredited entity Pegasus Capital Advisors is implementing that. This fund will make equity investments in sustainable blue economy businesses that will either restore the coral reefs uh, that have the best uh, chances of survival or address the barriers that are leading to the degradation of this. The project will create direct employment in the 13,000 people in the communities and also support indirectly 3 million people uh, by skilling them up for sustainable fisheries, aquaculture and others, especially related to blue economy. So uh, this is a fund. This fund is an example of how GCF is enabling uh, transition in the most developing countries. Of the 17 targeted countries, uh, there are LDCs, SIDS, and African states. So some of the most vulnerable to climate. GCF here acts as an anchor investment. We take a first loss equity position of 125 million dollar in a total fund size of 500 million dollar. And our investments are then made in uh, sustainable businesses that are able then uh, to support the climate action that is needed for these countries to uh, thrive and survive. This is the strong example of what our business model can achieve. Thanks, Raj. Uh, Kate Warren, back here to continue the conversation, now focusing on how we can support SMEs in the least developed countries and the importance of skilling and private sector involvement. I am joined by Heidi Schroederis Fox of the United Nations Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States, and Patricia Varinga, who's the founder and CEO of The Job Factory. Uh, so thank you both for joining us today. Hi, Kate. Hi, great to be here. Hey. Well, Heidi, I'd like to start with you. Um, given your role, I'm sure the upcoming LDC5 conference uh, next year is a big part of your work and what you're thinking about. Um, so what do you hope will come out of the conference? And I know you having a you know, start to it last week, um, but while the main conference is still a year away, how do you see it being an important moment for galvanizing support for building economies, particularly in the aftermath of this pandemic and catalyzing what has frankly been stalled progress on the SDGs, particularly in LDCs? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about something that is really important for us, uh, how we can all help the least developed countries reach their development goals, reach the SDGs. And as you mentioned, uh, last week was a very big week for the LDCs. They agreed on a new program of action, so-called Doha program of action. That is a 10 year program for all member states of the United Nations on how they can best support uh, in a comprehensive way um, the least developed countries to reach their development goals and to graduate out of this category of countries where nobody should like to be. And as you mentioned, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on these countries. Just to look at 
the numbers of vaccinations we have in LDCs, about 19% of people are vaccinated as compared to 68% uh, in developing countries. And some, in some countries, vaccination rates are in single digits. And for example, for most African countries, supply is a, still a huge issue. And LDCs are very much in debt distress, as uh, you know, for their development challenges, but also COVID has put a huge impact on, on this issue as well. So you have uh, these diverse resources from uh, humanitarian, sustainable development related spending as well. So, and the, the COVID recovery, I think will take years. And now we are having also growing number of different crises and conflicts. So it's really difficult to make sure that LDCs are not deprioritized in the middle of all of these other things going on in the world. So there comes the LDC, the importance of the LDC5 conference. It will be held in March uh, 2023 in Doha. And this is the second part, as I said, the first part already happened last week. But uh, the Doha conference will be held at heads of state and government level. It will include private sector, youth, uh, civil society, uh, parliamentarians. It will really bring a critical moment for all of these uh, different partners to come together to help the LDCs and to implement the Doha program of action. We now have a year to already start on the implementation. We cannot lose that year. And uh, of course, the, the value of this new Doha program of action is not in its political nuances. Uh, it really is how this new program of action will be implemented and how it will be um, uh, changing the lives and livelihoods of the people, 1.1 billion people who are living in LDCs. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for building uh, new momentum, uh, new partnerships for LDCs. Yeah, and as you say, with uh, what's happening in the world now, making sure that we don't lose sight of the many crises um, in uh, what are often overlooked, particularly by the media um, places in the world. Um, so we want to talk about the importance of, of SMEs and building economies in the least developed countries. And Patricia, you run a recruitment outsourcing HR solution company, The Job Factory, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So I imagine you get a really good bird's eye view of the skills and business needs really across sectors. So based on your experience in the DRC, what kind of support do SMEs need when it comes to growing and scaling their businesses? Thank you very much, um, Kate. Um, well, I actually have the privilege of being an SME, but also being on board of a, uh, employers organizations for the past, I think, 12, 12 13 years. Okay, and being in charge of everything that has to do with employment and, of course, training and skills and and myself uh, and the company now, the, the Job Factory, we actually are a TVET and I'm on board of a uh, state owned TVET uh, Institute. So it's really my daily my daily work. And I really believe that what uh, what we need as SME and I really like to consider myself as SME is that what we really need, first of all, is indeed training needs to be ongoing it needs to be continued you know that will never ever stop we need training we need mentoring you know having someone that's going to coach and keep on because people have great ideas but it's not because you have a, a solution to a problem that you basically know how to run hr that you know how to run accounting etc and of course i think it is the main thing you know digital we we have no choice and i really want to believe that somehow the leapfrog and I truly, truly believe in what I'm saying. The leapfrog that Africa is going to do on IT is just going to be amazing, you know, because we have no infrastructure. We have, I mean, all these things that we actually know that we don't have. But at the same time, think of it that youth today, most of the youth, yet 65% of youth here, they all have a, a phone with social media on it. So it means they already are on the digital, in the digital age, you see. And, and that is actually very, very important. So it actually means that it's even easier to 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 change i mean to to introduce to share to to train them into uh, all these it skills soft skills etc than the generation before you know am i still in my time i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no you're good yeah and what do you see as the role of private sector in investing in that skills training and development 
because I really think that you will not be doing, there's no way you can do without private sector. We are the one having all the, the companies, you know, amongst our organization. So if you want to do, because we need to develop companies, companies are private sector. They are not state owned, they are private sector. So basically you cannot do it without employees organization because that's where they are. We even have, we even launching program you know, specifically on informal sector because also many of SMEs today are part of the informal sector and we need to bring them in. But to do that, we need to have, you know, uh, skills, we need to have more people working. I mean, it's a well, that happens. <laughs> you see, these are daily, uh, daily, uh, daily, daily well, way of living. You see, we're talking about digital, but as you can see, I'm still on because I'm kind of organized for this, you see, so, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, great. Um, in the moment, uh, <laughs> real life experience of well, some of the challenges. There we go. That's interesting <laughs> because that, now you're facing a real real life challenge, you see. And, and, I, and I'm very privileged because I have everything around me to make sure I can keep on working, you know, and I really like the fact that it happened as we were speaking. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, as Alex Wong said in the previous panel, that I think there's something about 3% of people in LDCs don't even have the skills to access the internet, let alone connectivity. So, energy. Um, yeah, energy. it really, yeah. So it's, energy. Um, so Heidi, you know, you're with the UN, but you talked about really bringing in the private sector into the LDC five conference. Um, what are new ways, uh, you're hoping to see the private sector engage? Is there anything new or different, or what do you hope to see them bring to the table, particularly as we gear up to this conference next year? Yeah, thank you. And I was very, um, uh, listening carefully what Patricia was saying, really agree with her on, on everything, digitalization, sustainable energy is key key enablers uh, for this leapfrogging that she was talking about. I'm also very much believing in that. So fully support what you have just uh, said and great work that you are doing there uh, on, a, on, on the ground. Um, in the previous years, we haven't done so much with private sector. So this time we really wanted to make sure that private sector is, uh, as I talked earlier about the partnerships, private sector has to be a key partner um, in this uh, implementation of the new Doha program program of action. So what we have done is that we have joined forces with Microsoft and they will organize um, or we will organize together a three day long private sector forum in Doha uh, from the 5th uh, to the 7th of March. And uh, this will really provide a platform for interaction between company representatives and delegations from LDCs and other stakeholders and, and really providing opportunities for networking, because that's also uh, uh, very important. And we hope that this forum will demonstrate the business opportunities that exist. LDCs have huge opportunities mm -hmm. and how young, vibrant LDC economies can really have uh, potential to drive global growth and uh, for the coming de uh, decades. So um, it's a really uh, exciting opportunity. We're very much looking forward to it. Great. Well, in our, our final minute here, um, what would be just quickly your one call to action to those looking to support, uh, particularly SME owners in LDCs? And, and Patricia, I'll hand that to you first. Yes. So to me, I believe that's the main thing so far, and not only because I'm a woman, but I think the main thing is to make sure everybody's part of it. And you know, at the moment, what I've been realizing that we keep on driving Writing, woman, gender, whatever, but on the field, there's still, you know, it's still very, it's still a big challenge because it's not really happening. So we need to push to make sure that we really have not only written a piece of paper saying, okay, we tick the box, it's written there. And if we can't find them, if we can't have them, well, you know, it's a pity, but we really, really, really need to insist and work on this. And, you know, I even said, when you look at, you know, some delegation that do travel or go for meetings, whatever, how comes you don't? make sure they are women you see what i mean it starts there it really starts there because how do they see how the rest see that eventually we have a role model there and maybe they could do something for us and and we see that maybe it's possible and you know and it's so important because i've had personally i was a bit shocked but i've had a woman she's an activist but she actually asked me to uh, we, we met at a, at a french embassy and she asked me to be her mentor and i was a bit surprised because i'm like but you are kind of known already she says yes but i've got no idea of what i what I should do and how I should do it. And so that is extremely important. So as I say, make sure that they really are there and that they're really taking care of the fact that they are, they are taken into account. 
okay? And yeah, and, and for the rest, I think the main thing is train, and of course, don't forget finance behind everything, you know, because that's also something that you want or not, you know, to, to have a computer like I have, to have a generator like I have, to have all of this, even energy, it demands also, I mean, resources, money. So that's, we have to deal with it, you know? Okay. Heidi, your final call to action? My final call to action, you know, 98% of, uh, of this, all businesses in LDCs are SMEs. So there is a huge opportunity there and uh, they are major source of uh, employment and so on. So we need to really focus on this area. And uh, I think Patricia has well mentioned, my final call would really be the um, access to finance, uh, making sure that these companies have access to finance and that, uh, that there can be partnerships between the companies and also the countries to make sure that they have a good enabling environment and work on the regulatory environment that makes it easy for SMEs to work. So those two uh, issues, I think, are very, very, very crucial. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. I hope we'll see both of those come to fruition over the coming year. Um, to continue uh, talking about the role of partnership and private sector and skilling, we are now going to play a short video from International Organization of Employers Secretary General Roberto Suarez Santos and Microsoft VP John Frank to talk about the launch of a digital skilling initiative and partnership. Uh, so we'll watch that video here. We're very excited to be working with IOE and Synapse uh, in Africa uh, to train 20,000 youth and underserved uh, people across uh, four LDCs, Senegal, Lesotho, Uganda, and DRC, um, with, with skills, some basic digital skills, entrepreneurship skills, and work skills. It's going to be an incredibly great opportunity for us to bring in classroom together with online, um, with the goal of improving the livelihoods of, of the participants. So we look at this as really a model that can be replicated elsewhere. Having a partnership with Microsoft makes all sense, and we are very thankful also for, for, this, for this opportunity, joint opportunity. But what we want is also action-oriented outcomes and concerted commitment. What we mean by concerted? We should be able to define together an Africa roadmap uh, dealing also with these countries, which place productivity growth and skills development at its earth. This is, this is the beginning of a longer roadmap to pave way for skilling SAP, reskilling for the African labor force. And we cannot do that without other stakeholders, educational institutions, workers, governments, the whole society. We need also to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of people and of companies. At the same time, we need to have the right regulations, the right institutions. This is often not the case. Policy and regulatory barriers need to be overcome. This partnership came together through the discussions and the preparation for the LDC5 conference. And for us, it's an incredibly important opportunity to recognize that entrepreneurship, um, local, regional, global, we can find new ways of partnering with governments, with civil society and development community to, to improve the lives of people uh, in the developing countries. And, and I think it's, it, the challenge for us is to find those new, new ways of partnering for the 21st century. Well, thank you, Roberto and John. I think that is a great note to end on. I am now gonna hand it back over to you, Raj, to close out today's session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Well, I just want to give my great thanks to our partners at Microsoft, to all of our incredible panelists and speakers today, to my colleagues at DevX who helped put this together, and to all of you, especially, who are joining this session. Now, this session is meant to help accelerate action in advance of the LDC5 conference in Doha, Qatar, early in 2023. The conference, of course, is important. It's an important marker in the calendar for global development, but really it's an opportunity to make progress. And that's why we're delighted to bring this session and really try to inspire and push our community to use this moment to move forward. I hope you'll take that chance. I hope you'll take some of the insights and learnings from today's fantastic session and bring them to bear in your own work. We really look forward to connecting with you on this discussion here at DevX. If you're interested in the conference uh, and you're not as familiar with it, go to un.org ldc5 and you can read more about it. I hope to see you there in person next year.